the goal here is to kind of find some dirt that they're sad that they let out now. And I heard a lot of good secrets are going to hit. So why don't we go each person and say who you are, your firm, and fun size. <laughs> Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Pejman Nozad. I co-founded Pejman Mar Ventures in 2013 with my partner, Mar Hershenson. Uh, Mar is a serial entrepreneur, um, consulting professor at Stanford, started three companies from scratch and sold it to a public company. Our first fund is $50 million. We're about to close our second fund. Um, prior to that, I was an angel investor for 13 years. I was very fortunate to be seed investor in companies like Dropbox, Lending Club, Gusto, Soundhound, Danger, Adepar, and many others. I also invested in many companies that failed, and most probably you don't know about them. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gary Tan. Um, I'm managing partner of a firm called Initialized Capital. Um, what I can talk about is about $50 million <laughs> under management. And uh, we've we funded, well, before that I was a partner at Y Combinator for about five years, so I uh, was there f right from, um, you know, the first 150 grand SV Angel and Yuri Milner coming in and dropping 150 grand on every single company. Um, I started as a designer in residence, kind of uh, accidentally ended up becoming an investor, frankly. But, uh, you know, I'm a designer, engineer, built multiple companies. Um, and we're just excited to be able to get back into helping founders and engineers and designers build something from scratch again. So got to invest in uh, earliest rounds of Zenefits, Instacart, uh, Coinbase, Teespring, and more. Cool, I'm Charles Hudson. I'm managing partner at Precursor Ventures. Wish I could tell you more about fun size and all that stuff, but uh, <laughs> working on fun one. Uh, I was a partner at SoftTech for five years and went out on my own last year and uh, really enjoying being part of the pre-seed ecosystem. Hi, I'm Jim Scheinman, uh, founder of Maven Ventures. Uh, it's myself and my partner, Sarah Thomas, who's up here. Uh, we have a $25 million fund, too, we're investing out of. We focus on consumer software. Uh, before that, I've been an entrepreneur and angel investor for many years. Uh, we recently were, uh, uh, we had some exciting news. We uh, had our first uh, big exit from fund one. We were a seed investor and a large investor in every round of a company called Cruise, which was acquired by GM reportedly over a billion dollars. That, that was, uh, I, can't, I can't comment on the actual <laughs> number, but uh, we'll take credit. Um, but we, it was our fourth uh, unicorn exit. Uh, we've been involved in uh, other social networking consumer companies, Bebo, which was a close to a billion dollar exit, uh, Tango, which had a billion dollar valuation, uh, and back in the web window days, some of you might remember, MDC Internet, which was a $6 billion IPO. Awesome, thanks. So you guys are the bleeding edge of emerging technologies, you kind of know where all the cool shit's happening. So what's the hot sector? What's emerging that we should pay attention to? What's hot that wasn't just a few months ago? Take it. Well, I, I'll start with, I mean, uh, we're still a very big believer in autonomous vehicles and autonomous driving technology. Uh, when we did the investment in Cruise um, over almost three years ago, people thought it was, you know, 20 years before we're going to have self-driving cars. And I think most of you are still going to be surprised at how quickly it's going to happen. Um, you know, the GM cruise cars are already out on the streets and Google's driving around Palo Alto. It's already commonplace for most of us here in Silicon Valley. Um, so while it was a billion dollar exit in less than, you know, almost uh, uh, less than three years, a little two and a half years, um, which was a very quick exit, it's still really the first inning. And we've made two of our three investments that are fun two are in autonomous vehicles. Uh, robotics and AI are also very interesting for us. I'd say, uh, for me, insurance is an area where I didn't expect to be making as many investments as I've made. Uh, I've also, I guess if I just look at the last three or four things I've done, they've all been about uh, women's health. An area that, as a solo male VC, I didn't expect to be spending as much time in, but I've just found really interesting entrepreneurs working on things, everything from hardware to software, fertility, family planning, um, really interesting work happening there. Not a ton of other VCs poking around there, so. Um, that's a theme that emerged for me largely just based on the entrepreneurs that were coming to my office. What are some of your favorite companies in that space? Uh, the last two I invested in. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the hard part for us is there, there's lot, there are a lot of things that are really hot right now, whether it's AI or VR, like cryptocurrencies. And the hard part is um, these are capabilities. They're not problems. And so 
it's actually kind of hard. Like I'm spent trying to spend a lot of time around the Ethereum world because this is one of the most interesting new capabilities out there now. You know, Bitcoin happened, and it was this idea that you could actually have a decentralized currency. That that was fascinating. And then Ethereum takes it to the next level around what if we add a real viable programming so language they got around hacked, it, right? Like they just yeah. Got hacked. Oh, Ethereum is <laughs> actually a totally healthy blockchain, <laughs> but the DAO got hacked, which was an effort written. Um, using the blo that blockchain. Um, and so part of it is when you do something new, as any hacker knows, well, the first version is going to have some bugs in it. And this happened to be a $50 million bug, <laughs> which is probably not the first time, probably not the last time a bug like that costs that much. Um, so yeah, I mean, the hard part is I haven't made any investments in Ethereum yet because uh, I haven't seen a company take that capability and turn it into a real problem solver for people yet. But it's definitely there. Um, I actually have a different view. Um, if you look at back to history, the greatest company has ever been created in tech, most probably they were the most not hottest company mm -hmm. at the time they were created. So I think when we started this fund in 2013, you know, blockchain was really hot and then home IoT and then was drone and now AI. I think when you do seed investments, you actually need to have a different view of the world. I think you need to detach yourself from norm I think sometimes you have to detach from your belief, and that's where you can find the next Uber or the next next Airbnb. If you really, as a, as a seed fund or a manager of fund, you're really relying on what's out there, and you rely too much on the data, I think the chance that magic happens in your portfolio is very minimal. Got it, so you know, I, if I was starting a company and I wanted some seed funding, I just heard some awesome industries and sectors, What's the pitch? You know, like what's the pitch that resonates with you guys that you say, yeah, I want to invest in it. Is it just team and sector? You're like, I want to disrupt, insert sector here. I've got a great team, seed funding. Like, what? How? How do you approach it? Um, I mean, I, I think that it's really, really hard. You, there are some investors who do a really great job of picking a sector and saying, we're going to find the best company in this particular sector. And you know, actually, it's easier to do that Series A because you have, you know nine months, 18 months of data. You can look at traction, you can look at revenue, you can speak to enterprise customers, and you can do that. But at the seed level, you can't. You basically have team and idea, and then, frankly, that's it. And I, I actually don't think it's very viable to go out and say, we're just going to invest in this particular sector. I think you have to go start with the people. Um, you know, We got to invest in Coinbase, for instance, which is probably one of the few venture backable companies that could possibly IPO from cryptocurrency. And we did it not because we were out there trying to find a Bitcoin startup. We did it because, well, Brian Armstrong was uh, head of anti-fraud Airbnb. He stepped away from Airbnb in 2011 to work on something totally speculative, just basically a toy. And nobody really, at that time, everyone said, you know what, this is a joke. There's no way Bitcoin could be what it is. Um, but for us, we said, this guy's really smart. <laughs> And he is taking the opportunity cost to say, you know what, I'm going to step away from the hottest startup in 2011 and start this company, and this is going to be more valuable. And so it, it, it starts with the founders. How about you, Jim? Um, I think we have a little bit of different view on this. I mean, we are very concentrated. We stick to what we know. We think that gives us a competitive advantage. So if you're doing, for, for us, if you have a consumer software startup, we know how to build those companies. We know how to scale them with growth hacking, viral marketing, we've seen all the mistakes that you're gonna make over the last 20 years. Um, you know, with that said though, it's a pretty broad spectrum. So here, I'll, I'll tell you how we think about it. We have some ideas of where the future is gonna go. Three years ago, we thought it was self-driving cars. Google was the only one doing anything. When we heard Kyle get up at YC Demo Day saying, I'm gonna build this consumer self-driving car company, it was already in the back of my mind that that was a possibility. So then I went and met with him. He had the vision worth fighting for. It's what we talk about. Like he had this big vision that a startup could beat a massive company like Google. Well, that's actually not that crazy. When you think about it, the big incumbents often don't do the innovation. I mean, I think Google's doing a great job in pushing the regulatory stuff, but it's true that startups always win. And so I, I bought that, and he was an amazing founder with a great team, right? So for us, it's the vision worth fighting for. You know, there's gonna be a massive market opportunity. For, we only invest in billion dollar potential companies. That's how we do it. I mean, a lot of other venture investors will invest in you know, companies that could do well, singles and doubles, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just understand who you're pitching and what is they're looking for. And you know, in, in that case with Kyle, the great team, the great vision worth fighting for, um, and fit into the consumer you know, spectrum of our particular expertise, will make a big investment in that. 
I mean, I'll give you one other example uh, just quickly. I, I, I'm actually a big believer in VR. Um, and the, the only question for me in VR is when. So that's another piece of it is you can have the vision, you can have the team, but if you're too early, like I was number four employee at Friendster, we were a year and a half too <laughs> early. It happens. I mean, fortunately, I left and helped start Bebo, and you know, that was a great exit. But you know, that, that happens. It, and so with VR, it's going to be a new, massive consumer platform. It's going to be. The only question is when. And so we made a bet in a company called Altspace, and the only question of, you know, is that going to be the new, I think, the next kind of Facebook of the future or communication platform? Yeah, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. If it's five years from now, you know, we made a mistake. If it's next year, that's going to be a massive hit for us. I guess the only thing I'd say just, I look for independent thinkers. I'm just surprised by how much shortcut thinking I sometimes see in pitch decks and in the way people talk about, oh, it's kind of like this, but for that. The people I get excited about actually understand not just the size of the market, but the structure, like who are the players, like what are their strengths and weaknesses, and they, they tend to be a little weird. And so like I look for this intersection of people whose personalities are a little bit quirky and who have sort of deeply held but probably unconventional beliefs about some market that everyone thinks they've figured out. And when I find those people, you're either really right because they see something that someone else doesn't see, or they get absolutely trampled because they're completely delusional. But I find like those are the people that I relate to. I, I, I tend to find myself attracted to people that do this kind of bottoms up thinking and can tell me why the company that everybody else thinks is a runaway success that's headed for great things actually has some fatal flaw. And when two or three rounds later that flaw emerges, as a seed investor, I feel really good about having backed that person. But um, I just am I'm just amazed by the number of people that I meet who start companies who have never really thought about, you know, well, if, if the company that you, you're competing against makes one small tweak to compete with you, you're like right in their wheelhouse. Like, why do you win? And, you know, a lot of times the answer to that is crickets. I find people who've done the bottoms up thinking can kind of tell you, like, look, there, to, to Jim's point around self driving cars, there's a lot of good reasons to think that there was room for startups given the, the areas where Google was spending its time and energy. So I tend to get attracted to those people, which either draws you into spaces that appear to be kind of crowded, but where everyone else is doing the same thing and this company's doing something different, or spaces when you tell people what you've invested in, they give you this blank stare, like, I don't even know that that's a thing. So, and to his point, like, I, I'm a big believer in autonomous delivery, autonomous robots. I invested in a company about a year ago. I told a bunch of my LPs what I was doing and they thought I was insane. A year later they go, how is it different than the other three? And like that's the nature of being a pre-seed investor. The thing that looks crazy at time zero, a year later, you'll get questions around competition, market structure, market size, and it happens really quickly. Yeah, I was in the room uh, letting, I was a part of the team at YC that interviewed Kyle and I uh, went back and looked at the video recently. And right afterwards, uh, he walked out. We love Kyle. He you know, worked at a previous YC startup, like early co-founder at Twitch, super successful. And then we looked at each other and we said, oh, man, that's going to be a research project. Yes, we fund it, but that's going to be a research project, which is hilarious because <laughs> it turned out to be the number one exit for YC like to date pretty quickly, actually, like, I mean, less than two years. You know, one of the things that uh, this, some of the secret sauce, and I completely agree with what you guys are saying, um, and this happened with Kyle, is he was unbelievably passionate about making this a reality. And you have to have that drive, right? So he was at Twitch, and my question to him is like, you're a gamer. What, you know, what are you doing self-driving cars? He said, actually, I got lucky at Twitch. But now that I can, I'm going to go back to my passion. And he was telling me at MIT, he was doing robotics and self-driving cars. And that's what he wanted to do. He said, I want to be the first person to bring self-driving car to the world. And then I was like, really, I, you know, it made sense, I loved it. And he said, let me show you this. And he, he showed me a video of himself as a teenager building self-driving car technology, tinkering out with toys. I said, this guy is for real, right? And, and that, that's the kind of drive that you need to do these kinds of startups, to bring something so radically new to the world, like autonomous vehicles. So, uh, you've, so you've identified these amazing startups, right? But how do you construct the well-rounded seed portfolio? Like, I don't know what that looks like. Like, how, how do you figure out this is what a good portfolio is, so you feel comfortable about the future. You want to take that? I, I can talk about it. I think we have actually this view that investors don't create future, entrepreneurs do, so we have a very open view. At, as a result, our portfolio is very diverse. We have you know, genetics company all the way to consumer and SaaS. I think um, you know, we mapped this out for our second fund that 
you know, how many companies we have to invest in, how much owners should we have, but I think the key for us is just having very diverse um, um, set of, of companies. But going back to the pre previous one, I think the issue today in the Valley is just a lot of people are talking about people, but in action they don't mean it. And the reason is very, very hard. It's, it's, it's very easy when you have money to go buy diamond. It's very hard to recognize stones who have the quality to become diamond and that not many people are able to do it. So I think even when you look at, and that's why I think the seed stage now has, has two stages. You know, seed is the old Series A. I think um, in old times, if you had a product market fit, you'd raise Series A, today is a seed. And then the pre-seed is an opportunity that has been created. And you know, all of us are focusing on that stage. And I think there are not too many institutions playing in that. And we'll see an, an humongous opportunity to be able to impact that, uh, the whole ecosystem by, by playing in that stage. I would just add one other thing. <clears throat> I think a lot of portfolio construction ends up being a personal decision about how you want to spend your time. <clears throat> I think there's some people on stage who really like having deep relationships over several rounds with a small number of entrepreneurs. Like that's a great model if you want to lead rounds and you want to have a concentrated portfolio. Other people like the act of putting other people in business. They like being there and writing that check helping someone get started, but you know, it's a lower touch engagement. And I think part of it is, if you know that you like diversity and you like doing a lot of a little, like don't come up with a model that calls for you to take board seats and take a concentrated ownership position. You'll be really unhappy. But if you really like deep engagement and you're a high conviction person and say, when I see the thing that is in my bullseye, I wanna go big and I wanna have a long relationship, then, then don't do anything that would even remotely approach spray and pray. So I think, you know, if I were an LP in the room, I would try to gauge the personality of the management team and say, like, what are these people inclined to do based on my read of them? And does the portfolio construction they've shown me match the personalities I see around the table? Yeah, I think that's right. No, um, we think that one of our competitive advantages is to get active and stay involved in the companies for the first six to nine months. You know, we also highly respect the founders. We're not founders and we don't want to be, right? It's the founders that are going to have to make this company successful. But we do know how to get the train on the right track. We know how to get them going in the right direction. And that's where we feel like our value add is. And you know, while it, on one hand being consumer software is somewhat focused, we actually like try to diversify our portfolio within that sector. So we'll look at different platforms, one or two VR companies, one or two autonomous vehicle companies. Um, we'll, consumer health we think is interesting. You know, we have different areas of, of uh, interest and then we'll do one or two investments in those. Um, but um, we, for us, we stick to what we know. We think that's a huge competitive advantage for Maven. Is this just gambling, though? Like, are, 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 let's let's be honest. Like, you're just you see some things, you hear some good ideas, you have a good team. You're like, okay, let's do it. Is it just? Is, are we just gambling, or is there is there some rhyme and reason? Like, what's success? Like, you just get a unicorn. Like, tell me, how do you, how do you gauge success here? I mean, just picking founders. You mean early on? I think we look for certain qualities in founders. I think we like founders. The investments, like the actual companies you're investing in. Like, is it just? Are you just trying to find the unicorn that's going to blow out the numbers? Or, you, like, how are you? How do you model success? I mean, for for me, like, what I really like is trying the product and actually sitting down and, you know, uh, being an engineer. We really like just seeing if is the app you know, well engineered. Like if I scroll it and it's jerky, oh, that, that, you, that engineer didn't thread that thing properly. And if they can't thread it, well, it's kind of like Steve Jobs turning around uh, the back of a cabinet and being able to look at it and say, you know what, this is well made. Nobody's gonna see this back of this cabinet, but the person who made it knows that it's back there. Yeah. And that level of craftsmanship, that's like a pretty direct way to do that. Instacart was, uh, I funded it at YC, basically a month and a half into YC, uh, later than anyone else had ever gotten into YC because we tried the app. It looked just like the Instacart app that you can download and use now. And that was remarkable. I'd never, like everyone said, oh, grocery delivery, Uber for grocery delivery, yeah. but nobody had done the app that worked for, you know, and they had hired two people to go and do that thing. Got it. Um, it was really impressive. It's just look at the product, like cool. use it. So I think your question is, I, the way I think about it, I think all investing public markets to all the way from like public markets to startups, it's all about structured risk taking. And the people who get into it generally believe that they know something that other people don't know. And my guess is every one of us on stage feels like there's something about founding teams that when they come in that we can see that other people won't see. 
And so I would say, is it gambling? Yes, in the same way that like all investing is some level of risk. But I think we're all up here because we think we can do, do better than just pure gambling. There's an, edge. There's an edge. And I think for each of us, we all have our own vision of like what that edge is. It could be selection, it could be network, it could be your ability to understand some technology at a deep level, it could be product familiarity, it could be anything. But I think if you don't have in your own mind what your edge is, then you are just gambling. Uh, you know, I, I look at it a little bit different. I think that for a lot of seed and pre-seed investors with, who have no experience, it is gambling. I don't think any of us on the panel here would fit into that. Th the way I look at it though is, the truth is, and this was as an entrepreneur and as an investor, you know, I'd say probably, you know, 80, 10, 20% of what we're, what we're doing as investors or what you're doing as founders uh, is within your control to be successful. The truth is 80 to 90% is luck, right? It's being there at the right time, looking, seeing the opportunities to get lucky and taking action. I don't think that's necessarily gambling because that 10, 20% that we can control will make the difference between a massive success and a failure. So if you have no idea how to add value or you don't have a thesis, you're just gambling. Awesome. Well, I, I just got the, the signal that we're out of time. So thanks so much for uh, the panelists giving us some great answers. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Jagger.